at 267 West Center Street in the heart of downtown Marion is now accepting applications from adults, students, and seniors. The Harding Center is a beautiful historic building offering one-bedroom apartments and efficiencies at affordable rental rates. All utilities are included. Basic cable and internet are available. The Harding Center is equipped with an on-site laundry facility for its residents. The property is located on the Marion City Transit bus line and off-street parking is available. The Harding Center is managed by Starfish Building, LLC, Lois J. Fisher & Associates. For more information, contact them at hardingcenter at gmail.com or give them a call at 740-223-3288 the Harding Center, a beautiful place to live in the heart of downtown Sergeant's Marion. Greenscapes is a full-service lawn and landscape company located in Marion, Ohio. We specialize in making your home a beautiful place to enjoy your time. Fall is here and that means the leaves are falling. This year, let Sarge and the troops clean up that mess for you. We have the equipment and strong backs to handle any amount of leaves you may have. So sit back, relax, and let us take care of everything. Mention that you heard about us on Scott Spears Now and receive 5% off any service. Also, ask about our senior citizen and veterans discounts. From landscaping to lawn care, mowing to leaf removal, Sarge and the Troops can give you an outdoors to make your country proud. Find us on Facebook or call 740-751. Five, two, zero, November seven. 1963, almost 50 years ago now, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, a date that lives in infamy right up there with the attacks on September 11th, and certainly Pearl Harbor. Today on the program, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John Kennedy, by speaking with the mistress of Lee Harvey Oswald, the would-be, could-be, possibly named assassin, Judith Very Baker. Did Lee do it? Who knows? Certainly this has been argued back and forth for the last 50 years, but today we talk with Miss Baker and get a new opinion, version, and thoughts on what happened that dark day in Dallas. 1963. Here's Judith Very Baker. This is Scott Spears, and as we approach the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination, which took place on November the 22nd, 1963, we are joined by a guest who might have unique insight and input into this 50-year-old mystery, conspiracy as many people call it. Judith Very Baker, who was Lee Harvey Oswald's mistress and judith has written a book uh me and lee a very interesting read judith thank you so much for joining us well you're welcome happy to be here judith uh, as we approach the 50th anniversary can you believe it's been that long oh yeah for me it's been a long time uh it's, it took a long time before i could speak out and it's uh, been a blessing that suddenly uh, well, it started last year, but this year it's been overwhelming, the response to when they learn the information that I have. And, of course, we're going to be at Arlington on the 23rd and 24th of November in Dallas. And we're going to honor Kennedy. And it's our, that conference there at Arlington, it's only 15 minutes from um, Dealey Plaza. It's free, and I wanted everybody to know about that. Oh, I thank you for sharing that. I'm sure our, our viewers will be very interested. Uh, Judith, you said there you couldn't talk for so long. Why weren't you able to talk? I, I could show you autopsy pictures and uh, 
murder scene pictures. And in fact, we just got another one, a new one. I, I will not show it on video of Mary Sherman showing her arm vaporized off um, in a so-called sex murder that could never have happened that way. Uh, when I showed this photo to people in New Orleans, uh, they, they, they asked with horror because she was she was murdered on the 21st of July, 1964, the same, same day that the Warren Commission came to get testimonies in New Orleans. And uh, none of us wanted to talk, uh, but I think maybe Ma Mary would have. But before Mary, it was Guy Bannister. One month earlier, he was found dead, and, and a month before him, his pilot and the person that you'll read about in the book, Me and Lee, and this is what the book looks like for anybody out there, Great. Me and Lee, uh, he uh, was the one who helped get uh, Lee Oswald to Mexico City. He was dead. And we've re recently, Richard Sharnan has come across, uh, as, um, he's a professional statistician, and he's come across with incredible information showing that the actuarial statistics that they used to poo-poo over there in London, he's gone through all the, the death reports and everything and uh, straightened them out. And we have added many more since. And we now know that there's, an ex you do not want to have been someone who was involved in the Kennedy assassination in 1963. I'll put it that way. That being said, uh, a lot of water went under the bridge uh, 49 years. Why did you decide after 49 years to start talking? Well, I actually t started talking in 1999. And I said things such as that Lee told me that he had helped and that he was sure he had saved the president about three weeks earlier. When I told people something like that, and I told them a lot of things, um, nobody believed me. Then in 2007, Abraham Bolden, a Secret Service agent, and James Douglas with his book, the wonderful book, JFK and the Unspeakable, uh, they show that a man named Lee saved Kennedy's life in Chicago. And um, oh, I, I used to, um, I had other information too, and I had living witnesses, but people took my tapes and films and wouldn't uh, let me have them for public use and um, intimidated my witnesses. Now all that's different. Uh, they, they're protected now. And of course, uh, enough time has passed that many more files have been released. And all the things I was saying in 1999, now people are listening because it's come to pass. And perhaps one good example of that is um, in 1999, uh, 2003 on the History Channel, I told people, I told, you know, the American people, it, that uh, Lee Oswald had called me only 37 and a half hours before the assassination. He thought he was going to die. It, it was very hard for us. We loved each other very much. But he, he told me that he had penetrated the um, assassination ring. He was part of an abort team. Now, I told that to Jim Mars in 1999. And at that time, nobody knew about Tosh Plumley. He's a secret, uh, well, he was a CIA contract agent, and he worked with uh, the CIA and was involved in an abort team trying to save Kennedy's life in Dealey Plaza. This did not occur. They made sure that they would not be able to do so, but Lee was part of that team. So when I said that to Jim Mars in 1999, uh, uh, everybody else, nobody else believed me, but he did because he had just talked to Plumley and he'd just gotten the information that had never been published. And uh, finally, in 2003, uh, you'll hear that uh, Lee called the operation to kill Kennedy. It was called the big event. And you can hear that in my History Channel documentary, The, the Love Affair, which is on YouTube. Because then Howard Hunt came out, his, his son got Howard Hunt's deathbed confession to CIA operative who was involved with the assassination. And here you hear Hunt saying it was called the big event. So now people are listening to me, you see. Being that he called you just such a, such a short period before yes. the assassin, 37 hours, you say. Yes. What advice did you give him? What did you say? Was there any way at that point for him not to be killed? Well, here's what happened. Um, if he left, if he ran away, we would have died. They would have killed his family and everybody connected with him. And um, the other thing, he knew that if he were taken alive. He thought he'd be, he thought he'd be shot and not taken alive. But, um, you know, they did capture him and he had this 
He had a marine ring on his finger. I mean, people who hate the United States are not going to be wearing a marine ring that says always faithful. You know, Semper Fi, that's... Lee thought he'd be shot, and, and he told me that uh, he had a real problem because if he left, someone else would take his place. Now, we have a lot of evidence these days, and I'll give you an example, that maybe somebody did shoot from the sixth floor, but... Mr. Bird, who was an oil man, knew Lyndon Johnson very well. Why is it that he took the wrong window then? He, instead of taking the window that the sixth floor museum is always showing the shot came from, why did he take a window at the other end of the sixth floor home for a souvenir when he sold a building? So, you know, Lee said, if I stay, there'll be one less bullet aimed at Kennedy. And we have a lot of information now from Victoria Adams, who came down the stairs, saw nobody. Uh, she came out and just talked last year, finally. Her testimony was suppressed. We got death threats. I have to live in Europe, and, and I'm here just for the 50th, because I don't think anybody's going to hurt me. It'd be, it looked too funny if I got hurt this year, but I was in the hospital five times after speaking out in just three years. Mm. And, you know, I had to flee to Europe. Uh, my friends and family suffered. And I didn't even speak out for 36 years, and I thought it would be safe to do so, but it wasn't. Tell me this, uh, Judith. W w you talked about Oswald Lee was a part of the abort team, yes. and then there was an, an assassination team. Now, who organized the abort team, and who organized the assassination team? Well, I don't, you know, they compartmentalize things. I do not know who organized the abort team. I do know, of course, that Lee Oswald told me he was with the ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and he was borrowed by the CIA. And, of course, we were working on a biological weapons project in New Orleans to kill Castro. And at that time, uh, the CIA and Mafia were working together. Lee was the perfect person for this because his family was Mafia as well as military. I mean, his mother dated um, the, the chauffeur of Carlos Marcello, godfather of New Orleans. His mother's... His, he got uh, Lee when he was arrested in this, they staged, you know, an arrest and um, an event so that, and Lee would, was handing out anti, uh, I should say pro-Castro pamphlets and leaflets say, hands off Cuba, because he had an extraordinary um, life. I mean, we're talking about, he had come back from the, from the USSR after almost three years with a, a Soviet Russian woman and his, and his little daughter and that shouldn't have been able to happen. He should have been arrested when he landed back in the United States. That didn't happen. He even got a loan from the State Department, an equivalent of almost $3,000 today, to come home on. And when he went to the embassy, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow after almost three years, his passport was waiting for him. Now, that passport was stamped all over with USSR and so on of it because uh, he had to leave the country, you know, and enter the country with it. So when he finally, a year later, he, he wants another passport, one that's nice and clean. He doesn't want all that on there. And you know what happened? I met the man who expedited his passport. His name was Charles Thomas. He signed it as Arthur Young. And you'll see in the book that that man was flown in by customs. And at least passport was cleared in 24 hours, even though on it, it said he intended to go to Cuba, which was a forbidden place, and so on. So I met that man, I shook his hand, and years later I was able to find his family and to prove to them, because uh, he had tattoos on his fingers, he was married to a Chittimacha Indian, and I could go on with all these details I knew about him, so I was able to find him. And they were shocked, they were scared, they said, oh no, you mean he was associated with Lee Oswald? But then when they learned uh, what Lee was doing, that he was pretending to be pro-Castro and stuff. In fact, I'm going to show you something. This is in the newspapers, the a Saturday, the day after Lee was arrested, and he never thought he would survive. You have uh, Curry and others, and Henry Wade, district attorney, charging, and they're saying Oswald readily admitted he is a communist and apparently proud of it. Now, what's funny about this, it also says that um, he's openly proud of being a communist, quote, Lee never joined the Communist Party in the USSR. On top of that, soon after this came out, we have this lady saying Oswald was writing an anti-red book. So 
they will were lied about a lot of things about Lee, and you know said like he was a communist when he wasn't, and uh, that he uh, and here he's writing an anti-communist book at the time. I, I have something I'd like to show you. I'd show you how the press went and uh, distorted the truth about Lee Oswald and about Kennedy and the shots because the small papers before the big ones took over and changed all the things. We have a small paper here from the Chicago area, and it's on the, it was written on the 23rd, and it was published uh, the morning of the 24th. Can I read it to you? I'd like to read this. Go, it's going to stun you. Go right ahead. All right. This, they, what they did is they interviewed Malcolm Perry before the big uh, newspapers did. The big newspapers changed the story, and you'll see how. You know how we are told that Kennedy was shot you know, in the back? Well, and they moved it up to the neck, you know, and then that he was shot again, you know, in the head, and that's all the shots. One missed and hit James T. All right, who said he heard four shots? So, you know, I mean, they lied so much. Here's what it says. Remember, this is smaller paper before the big ones took over everything, but they had a reporter there to Malcolm Perry at Parkland, who was the, the number one physician that was working with the dying president. Here it goes. He said... The chest was not moving, and there was no apparent heartbeat inside it. The wound in the throat was small and neat. Blood was running out of it. It was running out too fast. The occipital parietal area, all right, that's right back here, all right? Wound, it says, the occipital parietal, which is part of the back of the head, had a huge flap. The damage a 30 caliber bullet does as it comes out of a body is unbelievable. There was a mediastinal wound, mediastinal in the, middle, in the middle, okay, here, a mediastinal wound in connection with a bullet hole in the chest. Did you know there was a bullet hole in Kennedy's chest? I'd never heard They've of never shown autopsy photos of his chest. So here's a fourth bullet, all right? There was a mediastinal wound in connection with a bullet hole in the chest. Perry called for a scalpel. He was going to start a tracheostomy, which is opening the throat and inserting a tube into the windpipe. The incision had to be made below the bullet wound. Now what we see on, you can go on the internet, you'll see this huge, huge gash in the president's throat. But here it says this, the wound to make the tracheostomy was below the bullet wound. So in other words, what they did is they just sh slashed all that so you couldn't see the bullet wound and made this huge gaping hole. Because it says the incision had to be made below the bullet wound. And then, then they worked on his right chest tube and put it in. He said the throat and the chest shining under the huge lamp. He'd look up or move his eyes between motions. Then he saw the pink dress and the terrible disciplined face of Jackie Kennedy standing over against the gray tile wall. Mm. Judith, that being said, uh, who framed Lee Harvey Oswald, who wanted to kill President Kennedy, and who went on and coerced the media into giving a different story? Well, our media today, you're, Scott, you're a brave man because the media today, uh, notice that your big news stories and most uh, news organizations and everything, I'm shocked because I came over from Europe and even in the five or six years I've been uh, gone from here, basically uh, not present just for a couple of days, the, the news organizations, they are, they're replete with all these ads. How can they do a story on Ford Motor Company saying there's corruption, for example, if Ford is, is buying advertising with them? Uh, this, this isn't even allowed in most countries overseas. You know, they're supposed to be independent. So first of all, secretly, we can say that these the media outlets and everything, they were not so independent. If you wanted to get... Uh, in tight with Lyndon Johnson, you're not going to say anything bad about Lyndon Johnson, or you're not going to be at his press conferences anymore. And well, that's always been the case. Now, here's what we have on November 23rd. Even though the mafia could have shot him, or say it could have been some low nut, although Lee Oswald was a popular man, and you can't even find a picture hardly of him alone unless it's an arrest picture. He always has his arms around women, and women have, have their arms around him. I even have a photograph of him irony diapers. He's a real, very violent man, right? Well, anyway, Lee Oswald was framed, but it was a consortium of people. We have, for example, J. Edgar Hoover, only four hours after Kennedy was shot, his SAC, the, the, uh, the leaders of the FBI in Dallas, 
sent Hoover a memo and they said, uh, what about these guys who made, you know, wanted for treason posters? What about these people who uh, we find out that, that uh, they, they wanted Kennedy to die and they were, you know, talking about it? And he wrote at the bottom of the memo, we have our man, no need to look any further. That was only four hours. That was before the evidence even reached the FBI offices. They never even checked the gun that day, the rifle, to see if it had been fired. Couldn't be checked by the time it got to the FBI, because then it was too old. Now, here's J. Edgar Hoover. Why would he be like that? Well, this man lived across the street from Lyndon Johnson for 20 years. They were buddies from way back. Kennedy said he was going to get Hoover to retire when he turned 70, just a couple of years. LBJ made him director for life. That's number one. Number two, you've got all these anti-Castro people, and they've made headways with uh, the mafia and with others who want to get Cuba back, including our military, especially the disgraced generals who felt like they were not allowed properly by uh, Kennedy. They wanted to bomb Havana. They, uh, Kennedy moved them uh, to a place where they were not successful. Con Kennedy didn't, just didn't want to kill a whole bunch of people and start World War III. So you have fired generals like General Cavill. I mean, this man's career was destroyed. Cavill's career, Charles Cavill's career was destroyed when it, Kennedy fired him over the Bay of Pigs. His brother is the mayor of Dallas when Kennedy was killed. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Or, now, there are other things, you besides Cavill, you have uh, Alan Dulles. Now, the Dulles brothers were running everything during the Eisenhower era, okay, just before Kennedy. You had John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles, head of the CIA. He, too, was fired by Kennedy. He was forced to resign, I should say, the same thing. That man, who hated Kennedy's guts, and when Colby, when Kennedy... Uh, appointed Colby to take his place, all the people had been working with Dulles, because they, Dulles had been in there for decades, they ignored Colby and kept right on working with Dulles. Alan Dulles is placed on the Warren Commission to make sure that nobody looks at the CIA as being involved. Best friends? Hoover. Lyndon Johnson. Now that's a fact. We can go further. Colby on the Warren Commission. Mr. Colby, former head, uh, World Bank head, he's the director of the World Bank, furious, the banks are furious at John Kennedy, who has printed $5 million in real money, treasury notes, not, not uh, your federal notes, you know, your Federal Reserve notes. Those, well, they, they, I'll put it this way, those $5 billion vanished pretty fast after Kennedy was killed. Now. The mafia and not even the uh, secret uh, CIA or anything could stop the fact that Secret Service was also involved. Secret Service called two men, Rika Reich, and another one, off. Well, look at off. They left two of Kennedy's guards who were supposed to be standing on the back of the car, his car, behind at Love Field. They left them behind. The police were directed. Well, I, I can understand how the police were directed to look at Kennedy instead of looking at the crowd. In every picture that you'll ever find when they're before, when Kennedy's going through uh, cities and things, you have the police lined up and they're not looking at Kennedy. They're looking at the crowd to make sure it's safe. But they were given an order, and it would, who was given, who, who got given them the order? We know that, uh, when I remember I said that Earl, is a, uh, you know, Earl Cavill was the mayor of Dallas, but before that he had been the chief of police there. Now, one policeman was looking at the crowd. You have windows open, should never have been open. You have the Secret Service. So, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm sorry, I get phone calls. I apologize for that. Oh, no problem. Well, and, go ahead. I'm just saying, uh, you, you can go look into it. Um, much has been written. The best books about the treason that was committed against the president is the book JFK and the Unspeakable, why he died I mean, and, I mean, how he died and why it matters. That being said, the whole consortium there that we just talked about, J. Edgar Hoover, Lyndon Johnson, uh, John Foster Dulles, who do you believe, did one person give the call? Were they all in cahoots? What, what happened well, there? You know, for a long, long time, 
people would say things like, how can you keep something like that secret? But these are friends. They're not going to and they're not going to tell on each other, and the people under them, they're compartmentalized. They just have one small thing to do. Vince Palomaro has come out on, with a book about the Secret Service, and he did, it's a fantastic book, it's called Survivor's Guilt. And in that book, you find out that all these Secret Service guys, right, right from the beginning, they were saying things like Kennedy ordered them off their car, ordered the bubble top off, and he didn't want anybody on it. And all this turned out to be not true because they, they uh, Palomaro did all, Kennedy was a great guy who never interfered. You're not going to find that in their books. They do not want all of the, all the pieces to fit. The pieces are of a big puzzle, but the people at the top are the ones who created this mess. And the people under them simply blindly obeyed. You know, Hitler killed so many people. He didn't do it with his own hands. I heard uh, E. Howard Hunt's confession. I, I know yeah. Jesse. Now, E. Howard Hunt pretty well. He said it was a, a sharpshooter named Sarte who pulled the trigger. And a lot of people were involved, but the direct order came from Lyndon Johnson. Do you agree with that? Um, there, I have to say one thing about Lyndon Johnson. First of all, he's on record saying, did they shoot at me too? And he acted frightened at one point, like he almost wet his pants and things like that. And at first I thought, aha, maybe he wasn't as, you know, maybe they've got him over a barrel and he wasn't that, but there are problems. Uh, we have le recently found out, it's just not, not too long ago because of a released telephone conversation. He's at Parkland Hospital. Everybody's wondering if Kennedy's gonna survive. He calls his broker and says, you've got to get rid of that damned Halliburton stock that my wife owns. That's what's on his mind. Why? He knows he's going to become president. He knows he's going to start the Vietnam War in high gear. That tells you there's a long-term planning involved there. And his feelings for the president, I mean, talk about crocodile tears. Just go listen to him as he says, oh, we are so sorry. You know, we have lost our president. I will do what I can. The man murdered people. Um, so much information is coming out. We have LBJ, this book called LBJ Mastermind. Uh, another wonderful book it tells everything you need to know about Lyndon Johnson. I lived 18 years in Texas, and I, I assure you that Lyndon Johnson is not Lily White. 37 hours before the assassination, you hear from Lee Harvey Oswald. When it happens, where were you? I had, um, after I was kicked out of the chemistry, uh, the research project that I was in, which was creating a biological weapon, and this is why Lee Oswald had to go to Mexico City. This is why, by the way, he had to hand out pamphlets and everything. I mean, the man came back from the USSR and they don't arrest him. He's got to dirty himself up to look pro-communist again somehow. So he's in New Orleans, you know, he gets himself on TV and everything else. But then he waits a whole month, a whole month and does nothing. We're waiting to see if the prisoners that were injected with this material died. They did, then he went to Mexico City. Now, I objected to the injections because uh, the prisoner or prisoners that were involved, I had uh, know that I had been told originally that they had terminal disease, like terminal cancer. So I innocently said, well, what kind of cancer does this one person have? And um, David Ferry told me, well, no, he doesn't have anything. There's nothing the matter with him. He's a volunteer who's going to get injected with something that they hope will kill him. Now, I, so I wrote a note, a small note with my initials to Dr. Oshner about this, and they kicked me out of the program. I mean, there was supposed to be no paper trail. So I was sent back to Florida. I happened, but they couldn't just completely kick me out of science at that time. It would look too strange. After all, I, I was in the newspapers all the time. I had newspaper reporters following my work because I wanted to cure cancer. And I was the youngest, I was only 19 when I went to New Orleans. And I'd given cancer to mice in only seven days, faster than it ever done before in all their labs. I had all this special training to make cancer more deadly. So I was returned to Gainesville, Florida, and they put me into a lab called Peninsular Chem Research. It was a research laboratory in chemistry. So there I was, and, but I happened to be among people who hated Kennedy. So when they, they it, it was announced that Kennedy was shot, they brought the chairs in and everything, and they were cheering and whistling when they heard he was killed. They cheered, and the tears were running down my face. And for that reason, I got fired from there. But there I know I see Lee has been captured, and it's sickening. They captured only 70 minutes after the assassination. 
this is uh, an incredible, you know, a description of the man in the window went out when you, well, what window and what man? You find out later that these all these lineups are crazy. And um, there's a, his name is Griffith, Michael T. Griffith, who did an, an essay on the composition of these lineups because you always hear, well, they had identified him in the lineups, you know. Well, what they identified was a man that was in a torn shirt and he was all beat up and t-shirt and they lined him up with three men in office clothes who worked for the police department. And this was a requirement. They're supposed to have like seven people standing there or five, they only had four. That was the first part that's bad. Second, these men are well-dressed and they're older than Lee. You know, they look very distinguished too. And well, two of them do, one of them is just a clerk. But here's what they had to do. Number one stood forth and he, I'm gonna make up the names. My name is Joe Blow, and I work for the Dallas Police Department. They had to tell their name and where they worked. He stepped back. Number two, step forward. My name is Lee Harvey Oswald. He's forced to give his name to speak. And I work in the Texas School Book Depository. Now, that was already in all the newspapers because these lineups were on the 23rd. Already in the newspapers. He steps back. The third person steps forward, he says, I'm a clerk that works with the police department. I get, you know, and the fourth one does the same thing. He tells his name and he works for the police. And then you have people saying, who's the one that killed the policeman? Do you think it was one of these police officers? Hmm. This is what they did. And then they put him in with a bunch of teenagers and they were wearing uh, prison clothes. And by then they took off his shirt and he was just in his t-shirt. And then he was uh, in with the, the, these other guys had shirts on, they took his shirt away. And he said, it's on film, you can hear him on YouTube saying, what are you doing, why are you, you put me in just with my t-shirt on so they can pick me out easy? And you can hear the policeman saying, yes. Hmm. Yeah. What was Lee Harvey oh, Oswald? Anyway, I, I was there and I did see Lee get shot in, you know, uh, only 47 hours after Kennedy was shot. Lee Oswald was shot. They got rid of him in front of 70 police. You were there when that happened. I was watching on television when it happened. I saw how thinly he had gotten. I saw how beat up he was and exhausted. I saw him turn his head, and I didn't know at the time that he was looking at Jack Ruby, but you can see it in the films. He knew, he saw him. Now here's what's kind of horrible. Lee Oswald was shackled not with just a pair of handcuffs, but each of his wrists were also shackled to another person. He had three sets of handcuffs on. There's no way he could have moved away and tried to defend himself. We see we, Mr. Fritz, his detective, I mean, he's, uh, he, he's standing in front of him in the film. You can see him walk away suddenly. As Will Fritz walks away, and he's supposed to be protecting Lee in the front, he walks away suddenly. Jack Ruby springs forward and shoots Lee. But why doesn't Will Fritz turn his head and, and react? Everybody else jumps and reacts. Will Fritz keeps his head straight ahead for several essential seconds. Uh, not reacting. It, you could tell he knew it was going to happen. And another reason you can tell is that you have nobody there is in a, in a light colored suit, except one person. That's Jim Lavelle, whose sister, by the way, was a stripper for Jack Ruby, if you didn't know. And Jim Lavelle is standing there and he's handcuffed, you know, to Lee. He's wearing a very bright suit. It's almost white. You can see it in all the photos. It's like, hey, don't shoot me. Don't make a mistake and shoot me. Now, in the motorcade, you find out you have a midnight blue car that, that Kennedy's in, and the and two cars ahead, they're dark, and the car right behind Jack Kennedy is filled with Secret Service agents, and they're in a dark car, and all the cars behind, they're dark, except for two. Right behind the Secret Service agent is Lyndon Johnson's car, and it is bright blue. And with it is a white car full of his Secret Service agents. It's like, don't shoot at me. Make sure you don't shoot at this car. As in the Elton's photo in the films, as the, as the cars turn the corner, Linda Johnson crouches down before any shots are fired. He's already covering his head. That's on film. It, it's, it's also, what was Jack Ruby's involvement I'm in this? Really, you know, and I hope you ask me questions about... Yeah, I want to get to that in a minute. Sure. What was Jack Ruby's involvement in all this? Well, first of all, Jack Ruby originally came from Chicago. A lot of the money and all that. We were talking about Sam Giancana and down in uh, uh, 
Dallas, you have Savello, who's run by Carlos Marcello. This is the mafia. Oh, they hate the Kennedys, especially Bobby Kennedy. And if they get rid of the president, then Bobby Kennedy will be helpless. He'll have to leave. You know, so you cut off the head in order to stop the tail. You don't cut off the tail because Kennedy would have just, you know, hired somebody else to go after him even worse. So they had to kill Kennedy, that is John, you know, they call him John. Now here's the sad part as far as I'm concerned. Jack Ruby likely, he didn't want to do it. We find that there are two telephone calls at least to police and they recognize his voice. He's, he's very good friends. He's a police fixer for the mob. He's always having to come over to his nightclub, gives him free uh, drinks and, you know, uh, access to girls. You, you see what I'm saying? Mm. So he's very popular and excuse me, I want to sneeze. I don't want to sneeze. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've gotten really, really tired with many, many interviews. It's just been wonderful, though. But Jack Ruby had actually come to New Orleans to David Ferry's apartment and where uh, we talked to him and he brought funds from Dallas, and we assume that's from the Mafia. The mafia wanted to ca uh, uh, Castro dead, and they were working with the CIA, and it's finally, a few years ago, finally admitted it, that they were working with the CIA on projects to kill Castro, and this was one of many. I mean, we have a diving suit that they lace with botulism, but the problem was they would have to, somebody had to give it to them, and they could die for doing that, or it could be traced to the USA, so they couldn't do that. They had exploding cigars, exploding seashells and uh, thallium to, to make his to make him get cancer a slow way and have his beard fall out and all this none of this uh, all of that could be traced because you have to plant the material but castro smoked cigars and the ploy that we wanted to use and dr oxner did uh, he had one of his he inoculated one of his grandchildren with polio vaccine to prove that it was safe and it killed his grandson that's when he realized how much people trust their doctors. And he had so many contacts all through South, Central America and Mexico and Cuba. He had been training these doctors for years. They resented the fact that Castro had cut them off from the USA's ex excellent training in Cuba. Uh, doctors, new doctors are now being sent for training to the USSR. And then they were being sent out to work with peasants. They weren't making million dollars as a plastic surgeon in Hollywood or something. So there was a lot of resentment that they never dared speak about. In other words, Dr. Oxner was certain that he, could, he had the contacts in order to get a, this weapon, this cancer causing monkey virus that we were working on. The same one that was found in the vaccine that killed Oxner's grandson, but has been enhanced enormously into a cancer. And it did work on these prisoners. So. That's, that's the crux of it. And Jack Ruby saw the material. He saw what we were doing. He understood what it was about. When he was in prison, in jail, he complained when a Chicago doctor came down, uh, Jolie West, who's connected with uh, not only him, but also he's, he's been a doctor for Sir Han, Sir Han, which never should have happened. And this man is a psychoanalyst and psychiatrist. He's a doctor and he injects people with things. And Jack Ruby said, I've been injected with cancer. And he told everybody he died of cancer in the hospital. They said it was lung cancer, but it was examined closely. It was found to have pancreatic origin, origins, but Jack Ruby didn't have pancreatic cancer. Well, that's because our original material began with pancreatic uh, uh, cancer type and we evolved it in, into something we kill through the lungs, lung cancer. So now, yeah. So, yeah, poor Jack Ruby, I mean, he's forced to do it. Uh, they'll, they'll cut off every protruding part of his body if he doesn't. He didn't want to. So he, but he knew Lee Harvey Oswald. Yes, he did, ever since Lee was uh, at least 13, uh, because that's when they came back from New York. And see, Carlos Rosello would have all these big parties, like on a Grand Isle or at his, he had a, he had a big uh, farm called Churchill Farms, too. Not the horse ranch, this is in Louisiana with lots of swamps around where literally we know that he threw bodies, you know, to be eaten by the alligators, people he didn't like. You don't want to fool around with Carlos Marcello. And even to this day, uh, so many people in New Orleans think, still think he's a wonderful man because of he did a lot of good, see, of course, to for certain people and not very good for others. In fact, this though, Jack Ruby was one of his own and had been so and Lee Oswald's mother had dated Jack Ruby, I uh, mean, dated Carlos Marcello's own uh, chauffeur. And uh, 
when Lee was uh, arrested on August 9th and this pretend that he pretending that he's pro Castro and everything when he was arrested um, the man who brought bail for him was a mafia Marcelo attorney got him out mm. so Lee was the perfect connection you see between the CIA and the mafia now when Lee was arrested they knew he wouldn't talk you see, he couldn't say, I'm CIA, I, hey, I was ONI, I was trained, and the CIA borrowed me and used me, and they put me in the USSR, and I worked there as a spy and got information about radar. He couldn't say any of that. Why? Because they would have killed all those CIA agents. So I say, this man's a hero. He didn't He didn't rat on any anybody. He didn't defend himself. All he could say is he was a patsy. Judith, what was your relationship with Lee Harvey Oswald? How did it start? Well, I was only 19 years old when I was sent to New Orleans, and our school got out, our university. I, I'd been working pretty long now, two years after high school, on projects, and I was being mentored by two Nobel Prize winners, Dr. Robert Robinson and, and Harold Urey, occasionally, not all the time, but also with Dr. Harold Deal, Vice President of the American Cancer Society for research, and Dr. George Moore, who is on record as saying it's okay to experiment on people without telling them that you're giving them cancer because you can't get out volunteers to do that. We've got a newspaper article about that. These, and then Dr. O Dr. Oxner, he works with Dr. Robert Heath, who was working with the CIA, like uh, injecting things into prisoners who were uh, sent from Angola up to Jackson Mental Hospital. And they were doing some things that were just not very, well, shall we say they're kind of smelly. That they were doing. I didn't know this. All I knew is that these are very famous men. And, uh, and of course, a lot of experiments they were doing is on prisoners and not telling them that it's going to kill them or something is because they couldn't find anybody else uh, to volunteer, except maybe themselves. You're not going to go and kill a doctor to see if a cancer works. So they, in their minds, they justify these things. I understand that. However, uh, they still could have used somebody with terminal disease instead of using healthy people. And so when I objected, I got in trouble. Well, here anyway, you have all these doctors working together, uh, creating this material. Lee Oswald is just perfect because uh, he, he's, by the way, a lot smarter than anybody ever knew. Played chess and all that. He's perfect. Uh, he was just, uh, nobody would ever suspect that he would be involved in a biological weapons thing, though. So he would be able to be an excellent courier. We taught him how to, to protect uh, the material. When I came to New Orleans, I knew nothing about that I was going to be working on something like that. I thought I was going to be working with the eminent Mary Sherman in a cancer research project of some kind. Little did I know it was to create, even though I had been working on a project that uh, I was assigned, and it's in the newspapers, that I, Judith has been assigned to discover how to make cancer more deadly. Think about giving that to someone as an assignment. Mm. That was my assignment for two years. So now I'm someone who knows how to grow cancer faster probably than anybody else that, that can't be traced. Because I, I didn't have a degree or anything like that. And I come I come to New Orleans two weeks early because my school got out early. And well, my I doctors know, I are out check in. I'm going to have a nice dinner. The doctors gonna, are going to say, hey, we're so glad to see you. You know, we can't wait to put you to work. And they're not there. They're not there. Instead, I have to use the tiny amount of funds I have, and I move in to a small room in the Y with two strippers, a Playboy bunny, and a waitress. And, and uh, soon, I'm quickly uh, being introduced to their boyfriends and, their, and the, the guys who uh, run their contracts, and I've seen more naked bodies in 24 hours than I'd ever seen in my life, my entire life. You know, they're putting on their pasties and they're spraying stuff in their hair and, and they're saying, honey, you can do this. You can make some money. You don't have any money. Well, I decided to take a job <laughs> with a waitress only. She was leaving the job and it was two, it was an hour out there and an hour back. Little did I know that that place was Royal Castle where Bobby Kennedy's men, um, they were watching Carlos Marcello, who was about two blocks away and that's where his office was. But Royal Castle was open 24 hours. It was open day and night. And the hours I was working there is when they were dumping information. Lee Oswald knew this. Lee was close to Guy Bannister, who was working with Bobby Kennedy. When I told people about that years ago, they didn't believe me. They do now because more evidence has come out. So 
I was getting in with the wrong people, and I, of course, I was at loose ends. I, I didn't know where I was. This is a really rough town. And it seems that they sent Lee to meet me, sort of, quote, quote, accidentally, at the post office. But Lee hadn't been given much information about me. And what happened is kind of funny, because I was going to be marrying Robert A. Baker, who was, at that time, I was writing to him at Eglin Air Force Base near Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And he told me, now look, we're, if we elope, I don't want you writing to, with your name on it. So put my friend's name on there, R. Rourke. That is, his name was Rally Rourke. I just put R. Rourke. And, you know, general delivery, uh, New Orleans. And I'll get your letter, but only send one letter. So I was sending this letter off because I hadn't heard from him. And I wasn't sure he was even going to come and marry me. But the R looked like an A. You know how you can write a cursive R? Are you there, Scott? You yes, I'm, I'm here. It's cursive R, and it can look like an A, you know, on a paper, piece of paper. It can if you make it kind of fat looking. And Leon had very good eyes. Now, he's standing behind me, and I know that he's supposed to, now we know he was supposed to make friends with me and get me out of the trouble I was in. That is, I was in with a whole bunch of, I mean, I'd seen more men vomiting in three days than I'd seen you know, my whole life because they were drinking too much and so on. This is not what I was supposed to be doing in New Orleans, um, you know, visiting show bars and stuff like that. And I was so innocent. I didn't drink. Even so, I didn't even drink one drop of anything. But the people around me, you know, they saw me as just a little girl practically. And indeed I was as far as understanding anything. So anyway, um, he sees that I'm asking for a letter for Robert A. Baker and I'm sending something that looks like it's from A. Rourke. Well, that's Alexander Rourke. Lee had seen uh, earlier that year, sometime in March or April, Lee had actually been in Florida. And uh, for the people to say that Lee was never in Florida, that is not true. Because he said later, he told me, you know, I thought you knew. Or, I mean, Robert A. Baker, then Robert A. Baker, I know at Eglin Air Force Base, was a secret agent. And A. Rourke, and it was actually an R. Rourke, he thought that was Alexander Rourke who was working with him, who was a CIA, who had a pilot, uh, Jeffrey Sullivan, that worked uh, with, with Baker and others, you see. So he thought I was writing to them. And on top of that, I had a newspaper rolled up. When I put the, the, this letter to be mailed, I dropped the newspaper that was rolled up. It was under my arm. I'd forgotten about it. It on the floor. Lee picks it up, and he sees that under personals, where people put personal messages, it had been circled with lips, and I kissed it with lipstick. And Lee's good eyes, he can see, uh-oh, what's going on here? Because uh, amazingly, um, it says Jario, J-A-R-Y-O. It says pretty here, right, and then the letter's J-A. I didn't know that Lee had... Uh, George and Warren Shilton and others used the word Jario, J-A-R-Y-O, it was just an accident uh, to, it was a, a, a word that means alert, watch out. They were using in their communiques. J-A-R was to, and for my husband, he, to be, he said, look, J-A are the first two letters of your initial, I know it's you, and my name is Robert, so that's the R, and yo is I, so, you know, I am J-A writing to R, Robert, that's how he made up the name, and it turned out to be one of these code names. Lee sees this stuff, and, he, and I tell him that I'm going to be working with Dr. Sherman, and he has just met the night before David Ferry, and this is from renewing an acquaintance that did turn out so well many years ago, and I don't know whether they had been in contact before that. I, I never knew about uh, to ask. I just didn't ask about that. But you know what? So I went. I was introduced to David Ferry. They said, are we glad to see you, he said, because I've got, I've got this trial coming up with Carlos Marcello. I, I don't have time to work on this. I, in fact, I'm scared to work on what we're doing now. It's getting too complicated, you know, and we asked for help and you've shown up. Well, you know what, they asked for somebody else. And when I showed up, it was too late to put the other person in my place. And David Ferry thought it was reasonable to have a young woman show up because he was homosexual and Probably they didn't want to compromise any young person who was male, see. So it t seemed to him to be reasonable, even though it was very unusual. After all, though, he was working with Dr. Mary Sherman, another female. She was the only one, though, in the entire 
huge complex that Alton Oxner had of leaders, all the rest were males. It turned out Oxner wanted me to work with Sherman because uh, I'm a female too, you know, and he felt I'd be best off working with her. So I learned all the things I shouldn't have learned. I learned that they want to kill Castro. They think I know much more than I did. Part of that reason, I had come from Florida also. And as you know, and I know I'm making a long soliloquy here, I apologize, but there's so much to say. And once they, you get the background, then it's easier to understand the rest of it, I think. So I had come from Florida where many anti-Castro Cubans had come in and they told me dreadful things about Kennedy. I mean, I hated him. He had killed, you know, so many innocent people at the Bay of Pigs died because Kennedy would not go and blow up Havana and start World War III. Well, I didn't know that part of it till later from Lee. But what really got to me is that, uh, and to them, is that I knew Tony Lopez Frisquet. So, I mean, Tony Lopez Frisquet was the son of the finance minister of Castro's Cuba. And he had had to flee to the United States, and I had been dating him. I dated him in high school, and I'm, I'm just two years out of high school. So I knew all these people. I knew so much about Castro's uh, own, uh, you know, his government and everything. They really, really thought I knew a lot more. And, and so they told me things they never should have. By the time the doctors got back, it was too late. And they had to put me on that the secret side of this project. And that's how it happened. And Lee was there. He was sent there to protect me. He was really sent by the CIA to, to watch over the project because they did not want this to get into the hands of the Cubans. I mean, if you're going to hand it off to a Cuban to kill Castro, you better make sure all the Cubans, you know, are legitimate and they're not going to hand a biological weapon into the hands of Castro, pro-Castro people or Russians or anything like that. Well, it turned out to be a lot more complicated than all of that. We now know that they probably never would have allowed this biological weapon to, to even come near uh, any Cuban at all. But they just wanted the weapon developed and, and uh, Oxner had the resources and he wanted to kill Castro. And we did end up with a virulent biological weapon that was placed, as far as I can ascertain, into nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, where it can be awakened at any time and used. And that's the sad part. That was almost 50 years ago. Imagine what they may have today, Scott. You know, it, it's such an interesting story. And I kind of want to just get a, a little picture here, knowing him as you did, having the relationship with him. If you had to describe Lee Harvey Oswald in under a minute as a person, what yeah. kind of person was he? Funny, sociable, not anything like you, you've been told, because, of course, he had to be different if he's being interrogated or something. Courageous, patriotic, kind, um, he was still maturing. I, he, he didn't get along well with his wife, and, and they had horrible fights, cat fights, and everything like that, but he grew. I mean, I, he was only 23 when I met him, and I was only 19, and we both had terrible problems with our mates, our, and uh, we had planned to, we found each other. Uh, played chess, far more intelligent than you would ever believe, liked to play different roles, be, like, if, like if you were acting, in other words, he loved the idea of being a spy. He got that from Herbert Philbrick. That was his, his model. I led three lives when he saw him at only 12 and a half. From then on, Lee was reading communist stuff, anti-communist stuff, because he wanted to be a, a spy against the communists. That's how all that happened. You, Lee Oswald was a generous man, too, a good man. You described him with very affectionate terms there. A lot of people in this country feel he is, is an evil guy. Courageous. Well... Oh, I, I, I hope people will come to the Arlington Conference, you know, in Dallas. But also, there are many photographs. Can I, do I have time to show you a photograph? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, and, you know, maybe I can show it to you. You'll be able to see it. This, this is typical photo. They, they showed dreadful photos of him, that, um, and they did a lot of, of, this is a good example. There we go. That's not, that is not his mouth. And if you can get close enough, I can try, can it, you see it close I can, enough? I can see that? that, yes. All right, now, I want you to look closely. You will see a frown. See the long line of the frown? Mm-hmm. Can you see it? I do. 
Now I see that blur that goes to make it look like he's smiling. See that? It's been retouched. Hmm. See it? I, I do. All right. Now nobody has a mouth that goes up and down at the same time. They've created this to make him look like he's smirking. And on the other side, they did the same thing. On, on one of them, you can see a drop of white out. And of course, they make his nose and they, they made his eyebrows thicker. They made him look really mean and nasty. And they also made his chin. See this chin? Yep. They made it square looking, so it made it square when it was really more pointed, so that it would match the backyard photos. All the photos that you see of Lee, most of those, they've, they've grotesquely um, retouched them. A good example is the so-called uh, communist salute. Do you remember that one? It shows him, he's grinning. It looks like he's grinning, but it's again, they have retouched the mouth. I'm gonna show you another photo. Just a minute. Okay. Um, for your information, this is what Lee really looks like. Okay. A little bit different, huh? A, a little different than that last picture, yes. Yeah. And that's what he, that's what the man I loved and, and wanted to marry, we wanted to marry each other. This was the man that they've selected the worst photos they could and they retouched it and make him look just again to show you like that. Judith, why did they pick this guy? Why did they put it all well, on him? Well, think about it. He spent three years in the Soviet Union, almost three years. And they don't tell you that he came back with a loan from the State Department, that he got his passport in 24 hours. What they do tell you is that he was a communist over there, even though he never joined the party. But he was actually working for our country over there. And he was getting uh, radar information because Soviets were sending radar installations over to Cuba. And of course, eventually Cuba was able to shoot down U-2s with it, with, you know, using radar to see how, where they were. And that was not easy. They had to use very advanced radar. That's some of what Lee Oswald did. And there's more. He comes back to this country, and because he, had, he was assigned to take the biological weapon, and we taught him how to keep it alive, to, to uh, Mexico City. In Mexico City, they wanted him there. When Lee finds out that he cannot pass off this material, he tries himself to get into Cuba. That's how courageous he is. He had already pretended uh, to be uh, pro-Castro so he wouldn't get hurt when he's in Mexico City, and nobody will suspect that he's anti-Castro. But now he's trying to get into Cuba himself because there's a very short shelf life on this material. And if he can't get it in, what's going to happen is, is Castro is not going to get inoculated with it. If Castro isn't killed by a certain time, the, the entire team that was after Castro, they're what Lyndon Johnson called his, called a murder incorporated of the Caribbean. And this whole team that knows how to work together, and I'm talking about the CIA had, had deposed people. They, have, they, they had killed Patrice Lumumba and others. We can go into details about that. But these people knew how to work together. Lee Oswald was the one they were setting up, and at the time we didn't know it. So all of a sudden they order him to come back to, to um, Dallas when he gives up. Now, why does he give up? He has a visa, my friend, that's good for two weeks. And as he could have stayed in Mexico City for two weeks trying to get in to Cuba. Instead, after a few days, he leaves. And that's because there's only a limited short life on this material. Now, we can back up a lot of this in my book, Me and Lee. And I'll show that book again to everybody so they see what the cover is. Yes. Yeah, that's me and Lee, how I came to know, love, and lose Lee Harvey Oswald. People are really, uh, you know, getting it now. And they're finally looking at the documents and things in it. It's starting to make sense to them. Judith, I want to ask you this. We started this interview talking about yeah. waiting because of fear. People have been murdered. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of bad things have happened. Hey, I don't care anymore. You know, I'm so angry at all the lies out there. I'm 70. Let them take me. I don't care anymore. I really don't. Do you have fear, though, that something could happen? Well, look, I mean, I could get hit by a car, and it could be an accident, or it could be a killing. Uh, I'm ready. Whatever God wants for me, I'm ready. I really am. Judith, I, I, this has been a, just a tremendously fascinating interview, and I certainly appreciate what you've been able to do here. And, and forgive me for asking this question, but as a journalist, I want to ask this. Yeah, I, I, uh, you have written a book. 
You waited a long time to write the book. There are people who would say... I wrote, I wrote it in 1999. 99. There are people who would say that maybe you're just doing this for financial reasons. Well, let's see. Let's see. Before I spoke out, I had a full-time... I was teaching at universities in English... I lost my position, I lost my profession, I've lost my health, and you know I was in five so-called accidents and they're documented uh, with people, they, they give fake names and the, the, the stolen license plates, I mean Geico would have loved to find these people. I was hospitalized five times within just three years after speaking out. I was hospitalized before and after being filmed on the History Channel. I've had threats uh, and I've sent just last year uh, a threat came through I, uh, I I told everybody on Facebook look I, I I wanted to go to Dallas and I'm calling it off because they said if you go to Dallas you'll pay and I put that on Facebook because that's what happened two days later maybe two and a half days later my bank account was well compromised and you know what they, they hacked my account you know what all the charges were to Houston and Dallas of all the places in the world. That was just last year. But I mean, I've had a call, for example, here's documentation because I have so many witnesses, you know, a call, do you want to have another accident? And I hang up, what can I say to anybody? Well, I said, it was 5.30 in the morning, and I sent out to everybody. I said, look, uh, I, I'm not gonna go to work today. And, and I called my uh, publisher who was gonna publish the book. That was back in 2002. I said, I don't want you to do it. Uh, but I went to school because I, I was now I was not teaching at university anymore. I'm teaching at an academy. My profession went down, down, down because each place these I would end up hospital or something they didn't want to hire somebody who's always sick or hurt. So anyway, I went to work. I got out uh, from teaching that evening. A black van started following me and followed me for about five miles. It was raining. I was terrified. I, it was near Garland, Texas, this is a big ring around Dallas. And I had moved to Dallas to try and find witnesses. I really did, that's why I went there. And besides, I lost my job at the university. So anyway, this black van forced another car against me as we're going under a viaduct. And my car was slammed, would have, I would have killed me, but a big sheet of water came up because it had been raining and there was a lot of water in the bottom, you know? And it came up between me and the car so my car didn't hit the cement of, of the overpass. Well, you know that woman, she said, she tried to say that it was my fault. And I had done it. Um, you know, it was my fault. Geico wanted very much to have it be my fault. But no, they found the black paint on the car. And they knew that, I, that this van had pushed, because I told them about the black van. They found the black paint. So, I mean, that kind of stuff is on record. And then in Orlando, I had two accidents in two days. And this is right after being filmed uh, for something else. Uh, and I want to tell you just a little bit about that because I, I got in the car and put on my brake and there wasn't any brake and slammed into a Cadillac. And because it was a Cadillac, I guess and they were very important. I was supposed to go to court the next day. It was that bad. I had whiplash and everything, but I had to go to school. Why? Because the I had been son working at us around material saying that I was a whore that had slept with the president's killer. And it was a Christian academy and they fired me. So now I'm in another school, I don't dare lose this. I don't, I've got to go, you know, I feel terrible. I, I have no choice because I can't miss any days because the school session already started, you know, and everything. So, so, so I, forced, I forced myself to go back and pick up my car and, and I'm gonna start to drive to work. I put on my brakes and I slam again into an, two more, this time two cars on the side and they hauled me into court. And this, the mechanic came, he said, look, I told this woman, lady, you're supposed to put brake fluid in your master cylinder. He said, I put it in yesterday. And he said, now that this has happened to this woman, she needs to go to the hospital. But I'm telling you right now, I crawled under the car and her brake line was cut. So I, I wasn't ticketed again, but I had to go to the hospital. And when I got out, I had a concussion, I fell. And it was so bad, I was in a wheelchair for weeks. So then I fled. I fled to, um, I'm sorry. I don't, really, sometimes it's really hard to talk about all this. No, no, I certainly understand. <laughs> it, it's, it's very difficult, and I understand, and it's a, it's a precarious situation. 
was all over. You'd think that they don't care anymore. But you see, this is an illegal government. They had these lies. They've got to keep the lies going. And one batch of, of leaders take over, and because they supported those lies, they have to keep supporting them, or they look bad. Like, are they stupid? The Do Foreign Commission stuff is 50 years out of date. We have 5 million new documents released, and they're still saying the report is accurate. And they ignore witnesses such as myself. Lee Oswald died for his country. He tried to save Kennedy's life. He even saved his Kennedy's life once in Chicago. And I've gone through hell getting this out. People are finally listening. Scott, I, I assure you that what you're doing is the right thing. And a lot of people are following your, your lead here. Do, do all of us who have interviewed you during this time, people like Jesse Ventura, should, yeah. should we be fearful of things like this? No, um, it's true that, uh, like, I, I wanted to visit my relatives here. Uh, I'm in Chicago, and I wanted to visit them, and they're afraid to have me visit them. They're afraid something bad will happen. Um, there's a school once. Um, I, in, when I was going to get a job at a school in Greece, it burned down. And when I tried to get a job teaching in Hungary, they had a threat that their school was going to burn down. And the threat was the same day that the book Dr. Mary's Monkey came out in Budapest. You know, it was reviewed and everything. And they fired me. I, I Sometimes I didn't know how I was going to keep body and soul together. But people who did see my things, one by one, they've been adding up. I'm at Loyola University, where I was just a little while ago, it was raining. That you couldn't get into the area. There were no signs. I'm thinking, who's going to show up at this lecture? There are 200 seats. And I'm, I'm thinking there'll be eight people. And I'm a little, I walk in, the place was packed. Mm. They had to bring in chairs. It was astonishing because everybody was wet, you know, and <laughs> soaking wet. J Judith, it, I... Yeah, I, I have one minute, and I, I wonder, how did Lee Harvey Oswald save Kennedy's life in Chicago? All right. Uh, Mary Sherman came from Chicago. This is the way we put it together, because all he told me is, he said, I believe I saved Kennedy's life three weeks ago. That's all he, he never overemphasized things like that. But we know Abraham Bolden says that a man called Lee, and we don't, there aren't that many Lees in the world, you know, called uh, the FBI. Now, Lee was close to the FBI. He worked with Guy Bannister. He knew the numbers of the FBI, you know, so he could call the offices. And there are many people, many witnesses who know that Lee worked with Bannister, including myself, of course, and not like Dr. Michael Kurtz. So he did call. And what happened, they arrested several armed men. And there, there was a, even a tall building there with a man named Valley, V-A-L-E-E. -E. It's so close to Lee's name, it's ridiculous. And this man had also been a Marine, and it looks like they had set him up a uh, same thing, scenario, to be a patsy. But uh, it was in time. Kennedy called it off. You can read the whole thing in James Douglas's book, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable, a magnificent book. So I'm telling you, the tide is turning. People are not stupid. If you hear anybody saying they def they're defending the Warren Commission, you tell them they're, they're obsolete. They're 50 years out of date. Well, I tell you, Judith Very Baker, 50th anniversary of the assassination of JFK. What interesting information. The book is me and Lee and Judith. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I've, I've enjoyed they it. it try, they can get a train day books or they can go to Amazon. God bless you all. God bless America. Thank you, Judith. I certainly hope you've enjoyed this episode of Scott Spears Now with Judith Very Baker, the mistress of Lee Harvey Oswald the named assassin of President John F. Kennedy. It's been going on for 50 years. I think it's going to continue to go on. That is the question of who killed President Kennedy. It's the last assassination of a president we've had up until this point, and hopefully the last we'll have for quite a while. Quite a historic episode of Scott Spears now. Hope you've enjoyed it. But for now, it's time for me to say, this is Scott Spears heading for the dugout.